Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Coping with School with EDS or HSD, with the amazing Shaney Weber. My name is Sarah Jo Ritchie. I am the volunteer coordinator at the Ehlers-Danlos Society, and I am your moderator today. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. So this is how today's webinar is going to work. Webinar attendees will be muted at all times during the webinar. However, you are able to type any questions you may have throughout the presentation into the question box at any time. Shani will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A portion of the end of their presentation. Please do not send your questions more than once. It's not going to increase your chances of having a question answered. It will only make it harder for us to sift through the questions and make sure we are able to get as many of your questions as possible. Now, Shaney Weber is a patient and community advisor and one of the most amazing people that manage our helpline for the Ehlers-Danlos Society. No longer able to continue her career as a special education teacher due to her hypermobile EDS, she became involved in the Ehlers-Danlos National Foundation in 2012, which eventually grew into what you know today as the Ehlers-Danlos Society. Shaney is a moderator for the Ehlers-Danlos Society support community on Inspire, assists patients and doctors from around the world who contact our helpline. She is also a patient advocate for the society, speaking with state and national representatives and the medical community about EDS, HSD, and the various issues that concern us. Additionally, she co-leads and co-founded the Maryland EDS Support Group, which now has over 500 members. She also co-leads the Ehlers Danlos Society's Global Affiliation Program. She received her master's degree in early childhood special education and in early childhood development from George Washington University, and her bachelor's degree is in elementary education from Old Dominion University. All of those are fantastic achievements, but for this webinar at least, I believe the best thing Shaney is bringing to the table is experience as a student, as a mom, as a teacher, and a fellow EDSer. She has a very good grasp on what our younger zebras their parents and their teachers should know, and to help them achieve the best results they can in school. A huge thank you for Shani for being here with us today. Wonderful, thank you. I'm so excited to be able to, to talk with all of you uh, today. So coping with school, uh, when you have a type of EDS or HSD, it can be really hard. I'm going to split this webinar into four uh, four sections, really. I'm going to start with how can kids cope with school if they have a type of EDS or HSD. I'll then move to teens. How, what are the special challenges that teens face when trying to cope with school and how can they manage better in the learning environment and being a teen <laughs> and all that that entails. I'll then move to parents. How can you support your child who has a type of EDS or HSD? And then I will finish with the teachers. How can teachers better support students in their classroom who have a type of EDS or HSD? So, let's see. We'll go to the kids first. Um, I know for the kids out here in my audience that it can be really hard when you don't feel well and when you hurt um, to go to school, to pay attention to what you're supposed to be learning, um, to do things with the other kids uh, when, when it just is, is hard enough just to try and be okay while you're there. But we're going to learn ways that, that you can feel better when you're at school and learn better. The first thing, kids, that I need you to do is to learn all you can about your type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or Hypermobility Spectrum Disorder. When you learn about what you have, what's causing your pain and symptoms, it can make you feel more in control but it can also help you teach others so that they understand what you're going through. If you have a type of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, you can say that Ehlers-Danlos syndromes 
are a group of genetic connective tissue disorders. That mean, means you were born with this condition and that you can have many symptoms in your body. Um, many people that have a type of EDS have hypermobile joints. They can stretch and bend. <laughs> um, they might have skin that, that stretches more than usual. Or they might have fragile tissue um, with, that tears. Some people with a type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome are, are severe. Um, it can, they can have troubles walking uh, or even getting out of bed sometimes. Some people with a type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome are mild. They, they can walk, uh, they can go to school, they don't have a lot of pain or symptoms, but sometimes they still might need some help. You can tell people that they can go to ellersdanlos.com if they want to learn more about what you have. Now, if you have a type of hypermobility spectrum disorders, you can say that hypermobility spectrum disorders, or HSD, that's the abbreviation, can cause your joints to stretch further than normal. And it can also um, cause you to have symptoms and, and pain in different parts of your body. They're usually diagnosed um, when other health conditions are ruled out. Um, but they can be just as severe or just as mild as somebody who has a type of EDS. Kids, I need you to learn how to be good reporters. Do you know what a reporter is? A reporter is somebody that that has a bit of news and they need to tell somebody about it. You need to be a good reporter about what's happening in your body and what you need. So think about what are you feeling? Where does it hurt? Um, what, what do you need and who should you tell? Um, for instance, are you feeling dizzy or does your knee really hurt? Um, do you know that, that going to the nurse, the school nurse would help, that you could lay down for a little bit or um, stopping um, an exercise in PE may help? Uh, think about what you would need to, to feel better. But who should you tell? You want to tell an adult who can help. At school, that may be your teacher. It may be your school nurse. It may be your um, gym teacher. It may be um, another staff member uh, at your school. Um, it may be the lunch lady. Whoever you um, see that can help you, that's who you need to tell. There's, you also need to know there's lots of ways that you can feel better um, all by yourself um, without needing the help of a grown up. But these are ways that, that you might have to plan with your parents um, in what to do. You can become a tool collector. You may wanna keep a little toolbox at home and a toolbox at school um, that might have pain management tools. Maybe um, a heating pad helps you feel better or, or being able to go to the school nurse and get some ice um, or, or medication or pain creams um, that make you feel better. Maybe um, you need to wear braces uh, to feel better. Whatever pain management tools um, help you, uh, those are, are things you wanna have access at school too. You may have uh, other conditions um, like a type of dysautonomia or POTS that makes you feel dizzy or makes you feel like you're gonna faint. Um, so you could have tools at school um, 
like water or, or salt tablets or salt, or you could wear compression socks um, or, or have permission to go lay down in the school nurse's office uh, if you're feeling really dizzy. Think about what tools can help you. Maybe sometimes when you're at school, you feel sad or you feel anxious. Uh, think about tools you, you can use, like um, your five senses. What can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? What can you taste? What can you touch? Going through your five senses can, can help distract you from feelings of sadness or anxiety. You can play a memory game, like how many colors can you name? Or can you say the alphabet backwards? Memory games like that can also distract you from feeling sad or anxious. Um, you can also do deep breathing exercises. You do it like this, you breathe in and out. You can do that five times. That can help you when you feel sad or anxious too. But you know what? All these tools can help you when you feel in pain too. Try them, they really work. Do your hands sometimes hurt when you write a lot? Think about get, using a big fat crayon or pen or pencil. Um, see if you're allowed to use a keyboard instead of writing. Or if you can use, um, there's these things called voice to text. And that's when you can speak into a device and it will write out what you want written. I can speak into my phone and say, I hope you become a good tool collector. And it will write it on the screen. I hope you become a good tool collector. There's lots of different tools that can help you learn what you need to learn and be okay while you're at school. This is a biggie kids. Play, play, play. I know, I'm a, I'm a teacher, right? Who am I to say you need to play a lot? <laughs> When we have a type of EDS or HSG, it's important to keep our muscles strong because they're what are holding up our body. You don't wanna do things that are going to, to make you worse or cause more pain, but it is important to play, play, play every day. You can ride a bike or swim and play in the water or go for a hike or play with friends. There's lots of ways to play that keep you active, but aren't big impacts on your joints, aren't making you hyperextend your joints or stretch them further than they're supposed to go, and aren't crashing into each other. So think of safe ways that you can play and keep your muscles strong. All right, teens, I'm coming to you now. Being a teen is hard for everybody. Um, and having a, a health condition like a type of EDS or HSD just adds another layer of difficulty a lot of times when you're trying to uh, go to school, when you're trying to make friends, when you're trying to maybe have a job or date. Um, it, it really is a challenge. Uh, but there's ways that you can better cope with school and all of those other challenges with being a teen um, by managing your symptoms better, informing those around you about your condition, and getting your needs met when you need them. The most important thing, as it is with the kids, is learn what conditions you have. Uh, learn about the type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome you have or the type of hypermobility spectrum disorder you have. Um, not only do you need to know about what it is that you have, but you need to give others um, accurate information about it too, uh, especially when trying to uh, get medical care for your symptoms or to uh, get your needs met when you're at school or just to have your friends get it. <laughs> 
If you have a type of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, you can say that Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are a group of connective tissue disorders that can be inherited. Um, most of you know that inherited means that it can come from uh, your parents or uh, grandparents. Um, that doesn't mean every person with a type of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes inherits it. It just means it can be inherited. As most of you know, EDS can cause symptoms in many places in the body. That's because we have connective tissue in lots of places in the body. Um, that also means that we can have um, symptoms one day in, in a hip or a knee, and next day we're, we're having pain in our GI symptom, or we're having a really bad head, headache or dizzy. Uh, it, can, it can be in different places in different days. This does not make it easier for our teachers, for our uh, families, for our friends to understand what we're going through. Um, and so really learning about your conditions and, and helping others around you learn about them uh, can be helpful in, in getting the support that you need. Our website at ellersdalos.com is a great place uh, for you to learn more about them. If you have a type of hypermobility spectrum disorders, um, know that these are a group of conditions related to joint hypermobility, but, uh, and they're often ruled uh, diagnosed after uh, types of EDS and other connective tissue disorders are ruled out. Um, but types of HSD can cause symptoms all over the body too. They can be as severe or mild as any person, say, with hypermobile EDS. Um, and, and it's also important for you to learn about your conditions uh, so that you can better support yourself, uh, manage your symptoms, and teach others around you so that they really get it. Um, Ellerstanlos.com, um, that's the place to be to learn all this. Um, it can be really hard when all of the thoughts are going through your your mind, when you have tons of homework, when you want to be with your friends and you're, you're texting and, and IMing and tweeting and so forth. But in the midst of all that, I need you to become a really good listener of your body. I need you to step away from all that and listen. What is going on in your body? What are you feeling? Where does it hurt? Uh, what can you do about it? Um, if, if it's something that you need help with, who are you going to go to? Uh, who can help? Um, maybe it's your parents uh, that can initially help. Or if you're at school, you go to your teacher or your guidance counselor or another trusted adult in the school um, for, for the help that you need. Um, but you do need to think about uh, what help can you get in place before you have these these um, issues come up. Uh, like, I know a lot of you worry about if you're going to have um, a flare up of pain while you're at school or, um, you know, how you're going to deal with a, a sudden headache or fainting in front of all of your friends or things like this that are so, so hard. Um, thinking about what would help you, um, not only right now when those are happening, but to have in place when those things you know that are gonna happen, happen um, is really part of, of what you need to do. Listen, you know, I may be, be uh, saying, sure, go tell a teacher, go tell your parent um, and, and tell them what you need and, and everything will be okay. Listen, I know that it's not that easy. It is extremely hard. Um, it takes a lot of emotional strength sometimes to to just tell other people what condition we have or what we need um, when we're really not doing well. You build that emotional strength piece by piece by piece. Um, and the first thing that that you need to realize is is 
that it's okay to have feelings um, and you need to process through the feelings that you have. Uh, do any of you feel angry that you have a, a type of EDS or HSD? Um, do you feel sad sometimes that you can't do everything your friends do? Uh, do you feel afraid or anxious? Um, you know, when you have uh, thoughts about dating or if you'll ever marry someone, if that's something that you wanted to, to uh, have. Uh, do you feel worried about being able to, to work in a career that you love? Uh, Boy, those feelings are so normal. I know they feel awful, but so many of your, your friends that have health conditions are feeling the exact same way. It's, it's really normal when you know that you have all the challenges every teen has, but you have another layer of having to take care of your body. You, you wish you didn't have the pain or the fatigue. Um, you may imagine what it's like to, to live without EDS or HSD. You may look at your other friends that don't have a health condition and say, oh, I wish I could have that. Um, you know, you, you think about, could I take a full course load? Could I join a club? Um, and, and you may feel sad that that's just not, not your reality. You know what? It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel like you, you were cheated or that you're angry when your life is different than those that are, are around you. Um, it may make you feel like you're misunderstood and it may make you feel lonely. These are really normal feelings. Know that you are valuable. You are worth having friends. You are worth having dreams. You deserve to learn in school. You deserve to make friends and have new experiences. You know, the fact is, we have types of EDS and HSD, right? Um, it's nothing to be feel ashamed about. It's just something that we were born with. Um, you didn't ask for it. Uh, you didn't cause it. Um, but here it is. This is what we have. <laughs> um, but that does not mean that you can't have access to learning everything that you want to learn about. It doesn't mean that you can't go places or have friends that really value who you are as a person. It's just that we sometimes have to be real creative about how we're going to accomplish that. <laughs> but lots of people do want to help you and they can help you. When you're feeling uh, really anxious or sad or really if you're having a lot of pain too think about uh strategies you can use tools that you can use to feel better um deep breathing exercises breathing in holding it exhaling do that five times um thinking about what you are seeing what you're hearing what you're smelling tasting feeling um, all of these exercises, all these tools can help you feel less anxious in a moment, can help you dis distract you when you're feeling sad, and can distract you if you're really feeling a lot of pain. There's also a lot of self-management tools that can help you feel better. Um, do you have uh, like patches that you can put on uh, or, or pain creams that can help when you have a painful spot? Um, can you get permission at school to use a keyboard uh, or device instead of having to handwrite essays and essays and essays? <laughs> can you use voice to text spe uh, speech programs um, instead of having to write everything, particularly if you have uh, painful hands? What about rolling backpacks? 
Uh, a lot of us have unstable shoulders or painful shoulders. Uh, what ways can you transport uh, books and materials that aren't going to be hanging off of your shoulders, for instance? Um, here's one thing that, that I know that you don't want to hear as teens. Man, I can remember being a teen and I did not want to hear this either. It's really important that you get good rest, that you eat healthy, <laughs> and that you stay hydrated. When you live with a type of EDS or HSD, we already know we have that. We don't want to make problems worse by having sleep deprivation or having vitamin deficiencies or getting dehydrated. All of those can make our symptoms worse. They can make us feel worse. So think about it. Get enough sleep eat well, and stay hydrated. I know that I sound like a mom, right? <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> um, but also, listen, it's important with EDS and HSD to be as active as you can too. Um, we've got to do things that, that are safe for our body. You don't want to do contact sports, high impact activities, or hyperextending uh, joint stirring activities. But but what are some ways that you can stay active and, and increase your muscle tone to better support your, your joints in your body? Um, things like, like uh, water walking, aqua walking, or swimming, um, playing in the water, going for a hike or geocaching, um, bicycling, uh, lots of different ways that are easier on joints, um, that are low impact but can really help your muscles stay as toned as, as they can be to better support your body. And here's a, light, a little side effect, the icing on the cake. So that exercise that you do each day, that's also going to help with those feelings of sadness, those feelings of anxiousness. Um, it can help with that. And uh, have a plan, um, you want to develop it with your school, with your parents. Um, they can be formal plans. Uh, you may have heard of IEPs or 504 plans if you live in the United States. Uh, these are both, both systems in the school system to um, provide accommodations for, school, for students that have special needs. Uh, there are similar so, uh, systems um, and plans in place in other countries around the world to help students with special needs. Um, but they can also be informal plans uh, that, that may be things like what I talked about of um, having a rolling backpack or um, what to do when your, your symptoms worsen of, you know, when, to, when you can access ice or or uh, medication, where that's going to be kept and who can give it to you and so forth. It's not easy being a teen of, for anybody. Yeah, I don't care how good they look on Instagram. It's not easy to be a teen for anybody, but it can be particularly challenging for those of us that live with a type of EDS or HSD. Feel as well as you can by listening to your body and by managing the symptoms as well as you can in addition to the help that you can get from your medical team, from uh, supports that your parents can give you and supports your school can give you. That helps you function as well as you can to learn what you need to learn, to have a, a full life with everything that you dream of. Take excellent care of yourself. I know all of those take excellent care of yourself um, tips all sound like what moms tell you, but taking excellent care of yourself is part of how you're going to feel and function better. And always know that you are worthy. You are worthy of learning all that you can. You are worthy of having um, any friends that you want. 
You are worthy of having new experiences and dreaming a, f a future for yourself and figuring out creatively how you're going to, to get to that future, what accommodations you need to have that future. You are valued. I care about you. Okay, we're going to go to parents. Do I have parents in the audience? <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of us. The family and the school need to work together. I am, a, as, as a parent, um, as a teacher, I know that this could be challenging. Some schools um, are easier to work with than others. Some schools are more open to meeting the needs of, of students with special needs than others. Uh, and so I know that we don't all have um, the same path uh, to getting the accommodations and supports for our students uh, that they may need. Um, I encourage each of you to learn all you can about the conditions that uh, your, your child has, as well as what supports may be helpful and what supports the school system or school can provide. I do have to be honest with you though, parents, your children, and the schools can all have different expectations for that student. Um, and so part of the communication you wanna have, not only about what the conditions are and what supports are needed, um, is, is making sure everybody has the same expectation for what they can do um, and what can be provided. Your basic goals with the school system is to share information, share information about your child, um, about their condition, uh, how it may present, um, if that impacts uh, their ability to learn, um, and share information about uh, maybe if, if absences are going to occur uh, for doctor's appointments or if symptoms worsen or if there's a surgery. Um, any kind of information uh, the school needs uh, to better meet the, the learning needs of, that, of, of your child uh, needs to be shared. Work with the school and with your, with your child to develop a care plan. Uh, that's part of what you need to do. Uh, maybe formal, maybe informal, um, but a care plan is needed for most of us when we're living with a type of EDS or HSD. Uh, the better communication you can keep with your child and with your child's school, uh, often the better all of this goes. That doesn't mean you need the private email address and phone number of their teacher, uh, but it does mean that um, there is a system to report what's going on at home and for them to report to you what's going on in the school and to make adjustments uh, whenever changes are necessary. Um, and then seek extra support uh, when, when the system isn't working. Um, if it's in school, maybe uh, your child needs um, extra um, support in, in the chair they're sitting in or in um, how tests are given. Or maybe they need extra support um, in, in college, uh, like a note taker or something of this nature. Um, the extra support may not be part of school though. The extra support may be um, items that you get through their medical team. Maybe your child needs extra support uh, in pain management or in stabilizing joints to safely uh, go through the school day um, or a mobility aid to go through the school day um, that you may obtain through um, their medical team instead. So seek extra support where, where you need it. 
ปุ๊บ just like uh, children and teens that have a type of Ehlers Danlos syndromes or or hypermobility spectrums um, and and many of the parents also have a type of, <laughs> of EDS or HSD while some don't um, it's important to you learn about these conditions in any case our website, uh, ellerstanlos.com, is an excellent place to learn about these conditions uh, and comorbid conditions. Uh, it's a great place to learn how you can better um, manage symptoms. And we even have resources that you can use uh, with your school. If I could just take a break real quick about, you know, I'm talking about sharing information with the school and you need to learn all, about all these conditions so that you can teach others and all of that. It's important to remember um, that your child's privacy needs to be considered. Some children want all of their peers and all of their teachers and everybody in the world educated about their type of EDS or HSD. Other children um, and teens do not want anybody to know what it is they have. Um, be respectful of, of the privacy um, that your, your child um, seeks. The school needs to have the enough information to, to help the student um, access the learning environment. Um, that is not the same as every class in the school needs to have an EDS and HSD presentation in it. Um, so really have talks with your, your child of how much, how much information they want the school to know and um, um, how you're going to balance that need for information with the desire for privacy. Also think about who's going to be providing that information to the school because um, that's not always clear. <laughs> As parents, I know we walk a lot of tight ropes. Here's another one for you. You need to balance the need for care, for care, medical care, supports in the school, all of that, um, with a child's independence. The younger the child is, maybe the more uh, support that's needed, maybe the more direction um, your child needs from you of how to manage their condition. Um, but as the child gets older, uh, the more that child needs to, to learn how to, to manage their symptoms independently, to seek help independently. Um, and and, and it can be difficult finding that balance. You want your, your child to be safe. All parents do. But think about um, ways, no matter the age of your child, of how they can be part of um, the management of their symptoms. They can be part of um, how information is shared, of who reports symptoms um, to the doctor, to the teachers, um, to who to whoever um, is needed uh, to help your, your child. Um, remembering the balance for privacy as well. Uh, care, care so that they're safe, but allowing for independence as they grow um, is the other tightrope we need to walk. Um, all children are not the same. Some children really avoid accepting more independence. They like having folks um, take care of them, or they may be fearful of uh, taking care of their symptoms or reporting themselves. Um, it's true, some families um, may not mean to, but they may be fostering dependency because it can be quicker or uh, maybe symptoms can be managed more effectively by just doing it ourselves rather than uh, letting the, the child do it um, on their own or with our support. Uh, 
And so always think about, no matter how young your, your child is, that independence is the goal. Um, think about how you can help your child be confident in that independence, be capable in that independence. Uh, the more practice they have at it, the better they'll get. Uh, and it can really increase even their self-confidence the more they're allowed to, to be independent uh, and take care of their, their symptoms or the management of their conditions and their reporting. Uh, so, uh, so work with your child on being as, as independent as they can by the time they reach adulthood, if possible. There's lots of things we as parents can do at home. Um, remember that our kids with a type of EDS or HSD are kids first. They are teens first. Um, they are not their EDS. They are not their HSD. Uh, and all that that entails. <laughs> so um, staying things like staying on a schedule or being consistent with your house rules or your expectations. Uh, chores or whatever. Um, they need to be reasonable for what that child uh, with e EDS or HSD can do, um, but, but they need to be consistently um, applied in terms of, of limits and rules as well. Um, let me give you examples because this is, is really talking too abstractly, I feel. Um, let's, uh, let's use the example of chores. Uh, for myself, I have a lot of, of joint instability and then in my shoulders is, is a primary place for that. Um, I, I am not able and was not able to pick up the trash and take it out to the curb uh, because my shoulders would dislocate. Uh, not only is that painful, but it could cause damage. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean I couldn't do chores. Um, I could take a dust cloth and keep the mantle and the pictures uh, dusted. Or I may not be able to bend over and put dishes into a dishwasher, but I can sit on a stool and rinse dishes at the sink. Um, being um, consistent in, in the expectations of the home. Um, is important, but making them reasonable for what their condition is um, and what limitations they may have from day to day or minute to minute uh, is also important. Um, but remember that there, there are children and teens first. So if your rule is to have, let's say, an 11 p.m. curfew um, to come home from friends, whether they have EDS or HSD or not, 11 p.m. is your curfew. Um, those kinds of consistencies really help help um, our, our kids and teens grow up. Uh, but as much as possible, encourage opportunities for, the, for your kids and teens to be with friends, to be active. Um, it can be really hard when we feel a lot of pain and we're feeling really tired. We don't feel like going out with friends or, or being active. Uh, but as much as this as we can, the better we're going to feel about ourselves and, and learn the things we need to, to learn to become adults. Um, take time frequently to talk with your child. Uh, check in with them of not only what symptoms they're having, but how are they feeling emotionally? Um, check in them with them often of how things are going at school. Um, you need to know if, for instance, there's bullying happening, or you need to know if um, they're having troubles keeping up with their assignments, or may need some extra tutoring, or um, are not having a good time uh, during their PE class and could use some real problem-solving help of how to do that. Um, know that your child or teen is not likely to say, I am sad, or I am angry, um, it's going to be more in your be their behavior that you're going to see uh, those feelings manifest. 
um, checking in with your, your child often can help you know what's going on. And, and know that it's okay to be, bring in a mental health professional, especially one experienced with health conditions. Um, if either you or your child are struggling, it's okay to get help. <laughs> All right, moving on to the teachers, our last, last section. Teachers, when you have a student with a type of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes or hypermobility spectrum disorders, it's important to learn what these conditions are, to know that you may see uh, pain or symptoms one day and they may not be there the next day, or they may be there in the morning and not be there in the afternoon or vice versa. Uh, these are conditions that can have symptoms anywhere in the body, but they are also um, can, can wax and wane. Um, know that if you have one student with a type of EDS or HSD, you only know about how EDS presents in that one student with a type of EDS or HSD. It presents differently from student to student with this condition. Um, and so listening to your student and, and their family and how it presents in them uh, is going to help you meet the needs of your student in your classroom. Uh, our website, including the page about what is EDS or what is HSD, on our website um, are great places to start that learning about these conditions so that you can more effectively support the student in the classroom. Your goal, is, of course, is to have students in your classroom learn access the learning environment safely um, and effectively. That may be uh, formally through an IEP, a 504 plan, um, if, you're in the, if you're a teacher in the US. I know for our teachers that are in the UK, Australia, Canada, and other countries that uh, these systems of accommodations are known by other names. Uh, but I do know that in school districts around the world and schools around the world, students with special needs are um, needing and obtaining accommodations to help them safely access the learning environment. On our website, we have the Educator's Guide to EDS and HSD Child. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at this uh, because it has lists and lists and lists of possible accommodations. No, ch no student with EDS or HSD needs every single one of these, but you can work with the families and the student to see which accommodations may be helpful uh, for the student that's in your classroom. Know that in most cases, you cannot see your student's EDS or HSD. These are considered invisible uh, illnesses. Um, how high their pain level is. You may not even be able to see that they just had a joint dislocation or subluxation, or that um, the GI symptoms are really bad today or something like this. Um, so just looking at your student is not going to give you the full picture. Um, they can, there can be unpredictable symptoms. They can fluctuate. Uh, they can change whether the student is standing or sitting or walking. <laughs> um, and then the medications or other treatments uh, that we are doing to manage our symptoms can also cause symptoms of your own. I encourage you to check in frequently with your student um, to find out how are they feeling and to uh, see what supports they need. But I ask that you do this privately. Students um, with EDS or HSD, or even students with a chronic illness, um, have written in many places about what they wish their teachers would know. Um, and, and these are just a few examples uh, that, that kids in your classes uh, that have a health condition, including EDS or HSD, want you to know. Um, for instance, sometimes sitting in, in class is an accomplishment all by it. They may not be zoning out. It's not because the, your class is boring, um, but, it, but they just may be working as hard as they can right then uh, to gain control, to manage their pain, 
um, to get through that moment of pain. Uh, but know that these that any kid with a chronic illness, um, including kids with the uh, uh, um, and so think about that um, when you're seeing students in your class. Uh, the kids also want you to know as teachers uh, that, that they understand how frustrating it is for you when homework isn't done um, and that they're frustrated too if they can't do a homework assignment uh, in, the, in the evening um, because their pain was too high or because they had both a doctor's appointment and physical therapy appointments right after school and just did not have the time or if they're taking medications that make them feel tired or types of EDS or HSD that cause fatigue themselves. Um, but again, please don't ask in the middle of class in front of everybody. It's so embarrassing take them to the side and ask privately. Um, they, they often want you to know what's going on with them, but they, de they don't want everybody to know what's going on with them. Chronic illness, including genetic conditions like EDS and HSD, um, have the name for a reason. It's, it's long-term. Uh, they're not going to be, be cured tomorrow. They're not going to um, get better next week. Um, sometimes it can look like we improve, uh, but it doesn't always stay that way. Uh, there are good days, there are bad days. Um, and so please just be patient uh, with your students with a type of EDS. Uh, they really are trying as hard as they can. At the base, what is the school's responsibility to students uh, with a chronic illness? Um, some students with an EDS or HSD will need legal supports like an IEP or 504 plan. Others do not need formal supports. Um, but know that for those that do, it's the law. Um, the school is legally responsible for, for meeting the needs of uh, students with special needs. Um, and so know what the laws and practices are in your school district um, so that that you're able to meet the needs uh, the best way that you, you and your school system um, can. I thank all of you for your attention. We could talk on and on for all of these topics <laughs> for hours, for kids, for teens, for parents and for teachers. Um, if we can all just talk together more understand each, each other more um, and know that we are all trying the best that we can. Uh, if anybody has questions, please feel free to reach out to me. You can always uh, email me at chaney.weber at ellersdanlos.com. And with that, I will turn it over to um, S. Jo. Uh, she, she can see if y'all any of y'all had questions, so she'll be able to ask me those. <laughs> That I will. Thank you so much, Shani, for a fantastic and informative webinar. Um, we've got quite a few questions. I'm going to try to ask them in the order they came in because it kind of fits with the PowerPoints. Um, but if anybody else has questions for Shani, the question box is still open. Feel free to type them in and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, our first one is from kids. Um, is there any advice for dealing with bullies that may not understand EDS or HSD, even when they get it explained to them? Mm -hmm. At its base, bullying is um, not about not understanding what EDS or HSD means. Um, bullying is about uh, control and it's about anger um, at something and it, it may not even have anything to do with us. Uh, as kids with a type of EDS or HSD. Uh, the best thing to do is to um, learn about it as soon uh, as you can. Uh, if you are a parent, doing frequent check-ins with your child or your teen um, can hopefully help you um, learn when it's happening um, and address it as quickly as possible. 
Um, if you are a kid or a teen, uh, telling an adult or more than one adult, if you need to, at your school, uh, whether be it your teachers, your principals, your guidance counselors, your school nurse, um, telling adults uh, that you are being bullied as soon as it starts um, is your best course. And for teachers, if you see any bullying happen, being uh, proactive and uh, following your school system's uh, policy for bullying, um, as soon as you see it, not turning a blind eye uh, are important. So look at discovering it early, addressing it early, and getting as many parties, including the parents of the of the one who is bullying, uh, to the table to clearly communicate uh, strategies going forward um, as early in that process uh, as you can is, is the best way to handle it. Fantastic. Our next question is, what is the best way to talk to my friends and classmates about EDS? Are there handouts or anything I can take into school? On our website, um, some of it, it depends how old you are. <laughs> um, on our website, we have brochures uh, like what is EDS or what is HSD uh, that you can print out as many copies as you want and hand them out. Um, to help people learn about EDS or HSD. Um, those are probably best for teens in high school or in college. Um, and for kids, uh, we don't have materials right now on our, on our website uh, to share with, with friends, but we are going to be uh, having resources soon. We are developing those uh, as we speak. So, so watch our website. Uh, we will have those. Absolutely. We've got some great plans coming up. I'm, I'm excited for them. And I know Shane is just as excited. <laughs> um, next question. Is there a place where I can find more tools other than the ones that you mentioned for my toolbox? Yes. <laughs> On our website, under uh, community resources, if you look at the bottom of the section, uh, on that you will see a mental health toolbox for EDS and HSD. That document contains a lot of mental health uh, tools that not only help with mental health like depression or, or anxiety, but also help when pain is high. Uh, so you can look through those pain um, uh, excuse me, the, <laughs> uh, those tools. Um, if anybody wants to email me at shaney.weber at ellersdonlos.com, I can also email you a variety of uh, pain management tools uh, if that is, is what you are looking for. Um, that, that most of it is on our website. I just have collected it all, all together. <laughs> so. Alrighty, our next question is from some members that are concerned with college issues. I know our focus was mostly kids and teens, but when you're talking teens, you're also talking about, okay, we're going off into college, right. you know, they're going from being, you know, having mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, aunt and uncle help advocate for them to becoming their self advocate. So some right. of the questions we had were, what are some ways to cope with college, such as dealing with teachers' assistants and professors that might not care as much as they should about one student out of like an entire lecture class? And um, some of them are currently working with their accommodations office, but what else can they do? Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that, uh, that our teens that are going to college uh, need to do is to contact uh, contact the uh, disability service department at the college you are attending. Um, before even attending, you can find out what options they're able to provide, uh, everything from note takers to um, uh, accommodations for, for absences or different accommodations for taking tests and so forth, um, as well as many other accommodations. Um, so 
first and foremost, get with your disabilities uh, service department uh, at your school. When um, college students are needing to take over uh, self-management of symptoms, they're needing to, to take over the, the who to report to if they have needs, right? Um, I have found that it's best to talk to professors and uh, teaching ins assistants early in the semester or even before the class starts to explain that you have a health condition that, it, that can affect how you're going to be able to this class um, and to also discuss with them any accommodations you have from the disability service department um, to, to better access uh, the learning opportunities in this class. Um, at college, uh, just like it will be in your adulthood, it's going to be you that cares about your condition and managing it uh, the most. Um, others around you, uh, from TAs to, to professors to uh, different departments at that college, um, aren't going to care as much about that as you are. Uh, so learning how to be, to independently um, do that, just like we talked about in the presentation for teens um, um, and with parents, uh, growing piece by piece, uh, the emotional strength to be able to report your symptoms to who can help you, be that a doctor or, or a disability service department or a professor. Um, that communication is key. Absolutely. And I'm going to add a little caveat onto your accommodations um, because one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard from one of our conferences about college age students and accommodations is over plan for the accommodations you need. If you don't think you need a note taker, always get the note taker because you don't know what day you'll need it. And it's always to have, it's always best to have things in place that you don't need, but may need someday, rather than all of a sudden needing those things and then struggling to get them in place. Right. So to go off of that, um, I know this question hit me especially hard because it's something I struggled with when I was in college, but how do you cope without being able to work? Whether that be a, a job during high school, there's, to make money, right, there, there's two, like that. two aspects to that to that question there's how do you how do you cope mentally or emotionally with not being able to work um and then there's how cope financially if you can't work right and that is really really difficult um know that there are a wide variety of jobs out there um, everything from jobs where you sit to jobs that you're able to sit but get up sometimes to jobs where you're standing all the time. Um, so think about not only what your interests are, what your skills are for a job, but think about what, what type of job, um, what type of work, what type of environment would allow you to, uh, to work as well as you can. Um, also know that for those that are more severely affected, not everybody can work. Uh, it's, it, you have to look in the country that you live in at what disability benefits may be available. Um, in the United States, uh, you would look at, uh, Social Security benefits like SSI disability benefits if you don't have work credits and you are low income. Uh, if you are in other countries, those programs are um, are going to be known for with other names. For instance, in the UK, it's known as PIP uh, benefits. Um, so look at the country that you live in, what disability benefits are available, who's eligible, and whether you are eligible for those. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, you also mentioned in your presentation of 
you asked if people felt lonely or afraid or anxious. And what you probably didn't see, but what I saw is a bunch of hands raised in the chat. And um, we were wondering, what are some ways to fight those feelings, like support groups, talking to people online? Like, what, what is your advice as an advocate on how people can cope with those feelings and maybe overcome them? Mm -hmm. It's got to be multi-layered. Um, on the first level are, are the tools that you collect um, and use when you need them. Uh, whether it's um, mental health tools like uh, guided imagery, meditation, uh, using your five senses, doing uh, memory games, anything that can distract or help you get out of, of an acute uh, situation where the feelings are too strong. But then it's also important to process those feelings. Uh, they're normal feelings. Um, some kids and teens are, are best with um, talking with their friends about those feelings. Some prefer to talk with, with one or both of their parents about those feelings. And some do best talking with a mental health professional that is experienced with health conditions like ours uh, to, to go through those feelings. Whoever helps you the best manage those feelings um, is who you want to add to your, your frequent communication team <laughs> to check in with. But then there's also larger communities uh, that can help. On our website, we have um, a listing of EDS and HSD support groups around the world. If you do not see one in your area, I can work with you um, on how to start one. There are many, many um, online support communities, uh, whether they be on social media platforms or we have a message board on Inspire, the Ehlers Danlos uh, and, and Hypermobility uh, Spectrum community, uh, where it's a great place to not only learn about your conditions and, and how to manage your symptoms, but also um, to get the support that you need with a lot of these feelings. What you're going to see is that they are completely normal and the wide variety of tools that different people have learned uh, that help them best. Uh, some of it's trial and error. Alrighty, one of our next questions is, um, how do you deal with the non-believers? The teachers, the staff that don't believe, even family members. Um, even if there's a diagnosis of EDS or HSD on paper and the associated conditions, what's the best way to pro approach that situation? It really depends on what your goal is. Uh, you are not going to be able to uh, teach every single person because every single person is not open to learning about these conditions. But whether that matters or not really depends upon what, what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to accomplish obtaining accommodations uh, for the uh, child or teen in the school setting, uh, you would you would go above the teacher um, and you actually would go to the uh, special education team uh, to get those accommodations uh, pa paperwork started and, and to start developing what plan may be appropriate for your child. Um, if your goal, on the other hand, is you want that teacher to um, be able to identify when your child is not feeling well or is having a worsening symptom, that can be really challenging. Uh, having a parent-teacher conference, including the child as much as possible in those conferences, to talk about what really you need them to, to do um, sometimes it's that they just don't understand 
why you're telling them about EDS or HSD um, and what you're asking of them. Um, or sometimes it's what you're asking them is not something they can provide. Um, having open communication of really what is it that you're trying to accomplish um, may help in that combination, in, the, in that situation. Or if your goal is just you want your teacher to know about EDS and HSD and they don't, they're not open to that, but you don't really need them to do anything, um, I'm afraid that's okay. Um, not everybody wants to learn about our condition, unfortunately. Teach those that do. <laughs> and to follow up on that, uh, what if it's a parent or what if there's staff at school that are not so much bullying the kids, but kind of intimidating them to hide their issues and kind of make them try to blend in with other students and keep up? Mm -hmm. When there are these kinds of issues uh, that are impacting um, the child or teen, be it in school or elsewhere, it's really important to pull in people that help. I am not a psychologist or another mental health pro professional, and I cannot advise on that. When there are situations where, where there is abuse or where the child is not safe or not uh, supported in a safe way, whether it's going um, above that teacher or that principal, or whether it's uh, bringing a mental health professional onto the team to um, help facilitate uh, what needs to be done and how to cope with these situations. Um, whatever needs that child has and that parent has is, is, is what needs to happen. Um, and we can't do everything ourselves. Um, so get help from who can help you uh, when you need it, even if that's a, a, a professional, um, a mental health professional. Yep. It's all about building a family of support, a support system, if you will. But that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like more information about anything that was presented today, please check out our website to find some more resources and information. Feel free to contact Shaney or one of our helplines via email or phone. And definitely consider signing up for our newsletter if you haven't already. It's a really good source for the most up-to-date information. Our next webinar is on July 10th, and we will be joined by Adam Sherman, who is a nurse and fellow EDSer, and he will be presenting on the effects of EDS and HSD in males, identifying and addressing unique issues, needs, and concerns. Once again, thank you, Shaney, for such an amazing and informative and helpful webinar. If anybody else has any questions, please feel free to reach out to Shani. She's an amazing person. She will get back to you and she will help you however she can. Technology permitting, this webinar should be available within a week or two, um, both as a link on our website and straight on our YouTube channel. If you found this webinar helpful in any way, please consider hitting that like button. Please consider subscribing to our channel. That way you can be alerted to when we upload our videos. Also, there will be a donation button on our YouTube page along with a link in the uploaded webinar. It's thanks to donations that we're able to offer programs like this, our research, and all the projects we're undertaking. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you again, Shaney, and enjoy. Thank you.